Thank you very much. And it's a huge honor for me to be here at IDS. Thank you. Um, usually, I'm not too much into intraoral photography because I'm a dental technician. But I'm teaching dental photography courses all over the world about intraoral, close-up, portraits, artistic photography for dentists, and uh, some laboratory photography. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about the settings, about the recommendations for the equipment. So in case you are st want to start with dental photography, you will have a good start here. You can also find all the details in my, uh, in my book. So we can start, because I have only limited time, half an hour. Usually, my course is about three days. So um, I will try to be as short as possible so you can have an idea about what I do. So we need dental photography for self-evaluation. When I started to do dental photography, I was thinking about myself that I'm a very good dental technician. And when I put my first case on a big screen, I saw how miserable my work was and how bad dental technician I am. So basically, dental photography will help you improve your work. You will see all your mistakes much better. And this will be your best teacher. Then the next thing, what we need good dental photography, even if it's intraoral, we need it for DSD planning, because everybody knows it's the best communication tool between the dentist, technician, and the patient. So we need good photography for this. Nowadays, we go more and more for digital workflows, but still, photography is used for that. Photography for color, because many dentists work with technicians that are not so close to them. Then we need uh, photography for color, for shade taking, and usually during my courses, I'm teaching this protocol. It's extremely easy, and everybody can do it. Documentation and database for intraoral photography. Usually, if we have and receiving a new patient, you can make a full set of photos before, during the treatment, and after the treatment. And um, I will try to talk a little bit about this later. Why we need dental photography is also because we have different type of patients. Some of them are okay to work with, but some of them are very difficult. And then it's very good to have this documentation well done, what I told you before, before, during, and after the treatment. So you can have proof of your work. I'm using a lot of dental photography for my publications because sometimes if you are good enough and you make good photos, people can notice you and they can ask for your photos to put on the cover of different kinds of magazines. And this is uh, something good uh, for you. Then we need dental photography for conferences and lectures because you go to many conferences, to many lectures, and you see maybe very good speakers, but they have very bad photography. So if you are doing lectures and courses, I advise that you should have also the same level of quality of the photos as if you are good, you need to show that through very good pictures. Then we use photography for marketing and branding because nowadays we have to stand in front of everybody else. We have to be different. We have to do something better than others are doing. And this is a good way that you don't have to steal the pictures anymore from Google. You can make your own photos. You can make your own advertisement using simple tools like Keynote because everybody who was to a DSD course, they know about Keynote. So um, I'm doing everything with this software and using my own photos. As you can see, this kind of photography comes directly from the camera. I don't do too much editing because I hate complicated stuff, complicated protocols, and complicated Photoshop, let's say. I will tell you a few words about the concept, Shoot Like a Pro, and how I made this one for dentists and technicians. Uh, I was thinking about just taking the camera from the table and make the photo and put the camera back. Before, I was taking the camera, I was making 100 photos, and out of 100 photos, only one was good. So what I did, I made a very easy protocol for everybody to use without knowing all the buttons from the camera, without knowing all the settings. So I made uh, a simple edit, uh, I made a simple uh, setting protocol and a simple uh, unique settings. I will talk about this a little bit later. One camera kit, so what actually I'm showing to you is I'm always having only one body, only one lens, and only one set of lights. And with this, I'm doing all my photos. I don't take the lens down. I put another lens and another body and another lights and so on. So it will be much easier for you to do professional level dental photography. OK? And of course, one editing protocol, which is extremely simple. You just drag and drop the picture you like into Keynote and then arrange it a little bit. I will talk more detailed a little bit later. 
So basically, after you learn to do this kind of, uh, you learn my protocol, you will be able to do amazing intraoral photos, close-up photos, uh, laboratory photos, without any editing almost. The pictures must come perfect directly from the camera, 95, 99%, and only 1% to 5% will be editing. So when you will look at your camera, you will see that it is uh, good from the start, the picture. Now, if you want to have portraits, these are the settings that I'm recommending, F10, F11. And you will be able to do directly from the camera this kind of photography. Then, if you want to do close-up photography, F14, F18, and then you will have this kind of photos directly from the camera. Intraoral and laboratory, F22, F29, and then you can make intraoral photos with a lot of texture, with a lot of quality. Cross-polarization is for fun. If you create slices of the tooth, you need a huge F, F32, F45. And basically, these are all the settings in the camera. These settings that you see over here, we put them only once in the camera, and then we forget completely about all other settings. And the only thing we need to remember is these F numbers. OK, now we have a patient, and he comes into our room, and we need to make portrait. OK, we remember F10, F11. If we need close-up, we go for these settings, and that's it. These settings here that you see, you put them in the camera only once, and you forget about them. So I will explain you a little bit about each setting, so you can have an idea. I know this is not a course, but at least you can have an idea about what each setting is doing, OK? So center-weighted setting, center -weighted setting is about uh, how the camera is measuring the light is about uh, static photography, actually. It's recommended when you do macro photography, dental photography, because also dental photography is a static one. The patient is usually not running through the office. He's sitting on a chair, calm, relaxed, I hope. And uh, you can shoot him. Then, ISO 100 is about the sensitivity of the sensor to the light. It's about how much light will absorb the sensor. This is the native capacity of ISO 100, and I always keep it this way. I don't change it never, because I want to use always artificial light. So I'm using twin flashes, or I'm using studio lights, but I always give artificial light for my picture. So I will keep it to 100. If I increase this number, I will get noise in the picture. You know, the small dots, the small particles there. So you don't want to have that. And um, that's why we keep it to 100. Then we are going to have clear and sharp photos. Then exposure time. We don't need optical stabilization because we make the photo so fast that even if our hand is shaking or if the patient is moving, you can freeze the moment then, OK? This is the setting that we put in the camera. Forget about it. Then another setting that we use is white balance on flash. This is because we are always using artificial light and we are using flashlights. In my protocol, I never use continuous light. I always use 5,500 kelvins. That is normal output. It's daylight from studio lights, usually, or from twin flashes that we use, or ring flashes that we use in our daily practice. If you're going to use a different white balance setting, you will have Bluetooth, you will have yellow tooth, and different kind of colors, so you don't want that. You want to have as much as possible close to the natural result. Then we have autofocus single. I'm always using autofocus in my office because I always have a good light. Every laboratory or every dental studio should have good light inside. So then you can use autofocus of the lens because it will be much, much faster. If you are trying to do your manual zoom and you are trying to do a manual focus, you will lose time. And my protocol is everything about uh, time saving, not about losing time. Then about the formats, here is very important. If you are making an article for Quintessence, for Cosmetic Journal of Dentistry, for very prestigious magazines, then they will ask usually for a rough format, because the rough format you cannot Photoshop, you cannot hide the truth, and you cannot lie. They will not accept a JPEG photo, because you can Photoshop a JPEG photo, and you can hide the truth. If you did a mistake, you can Photoshop it, you can make it look nice, and people will think that you are very good. But we don't want that. So this is the format that I recommend usually for dental photography. In my case, I'm using 99% of the time JPEG format. I don't Photoshop it, I don't edit it. I just leave it usually like it's in the camera. And you will see later how they look like without editing. 
sRGB. This is a format that will help your picture to look a little bit more vivid, more alive, more brighter colors. So the picture will look a little bit, let's say, more catchy. If you are going to use Adobe RGB, this is for people that use Photoshop and they want to edit heavy the picture, then it's recommended Adobe RGB. But if you are not a Photoshop user, keep it simple and don't lose time. Now, there are two different kinds of photographers, Canon photographers and Nikon photographers. If you have a Nikon, I recommend you Vivid format. Picture control and you change to Vivid. If you have Canon camera, I recommend you Faithful or Fine Detail. This is close as possible to the natural situation. And if you want to do black and white, just change to monochrome. Now I will show you something else. Tips and tricks for dental photography. If you have Nikon or Canon cameras and you go inside the picture control menu and you choose Vivid or for Canon you choose Faithful, you can go inside and change the sharpening. This is how you can calibrate your lens to have very sharp pictures. Even if you have a macro lens, sometimes you get blurry pictures or not so sharp as you want. And then you can calibrate your lens and move the sharpening usually comes from the factory to one or zero. You can go all the way to nine. And then you will ha have extremely sharp pictures. Optical stabilization system is required only when you are making and shooting photography for sports or for kids that are running. But we do dental photography, which is static photography, and we use very short exposure time. You remember one on 125, it means one second split into 125 times. That means that when we push the button, we are going to make the photo so fast that even if the patient is moving or we are moving, the picture will be very still and it will look very nice. So we don't need optical stabilization. Even on my camera, I have the Tokina lens, and this one doesn't even have optical stabilization. And I'm using this lens for more than two years, and all my pictures look very sharp, and I don't need it, because I use short exposure time. Then, I was telling you about autofocus uh, option. I'm not using manual focus, never, because I always have good light inside the room where I'm working. No matter if I'm in a studio or in the laboratory, I always have good lights, and then I leave my camera to do the focus for me, it will be much faster than manual focus. Manual focus usually we use when we shoot from the tripod, we shoot insects or bugs or different kinds of things like that, but our patients usually are moving and we need to have a very fast autofocus. Then, if your camera doesn't have this secondary screen here, it means that it's a toy camera, let's say amateur camera, camera that you cannot go all the way to professional level. You can do good photography with that kind of cameras, but usually semi-professional or professional cameras have a secondary LCD screen. It means that it has a better sensor, better chipset inside, and better electronics in general. And you can have much faster access to the main settings, the F, the ISO, and the uh, exposure time. And if you are using other cards than SanDisk, this is the most compatible with Canon and Nikon. And it, it, you have to look that it has minimum 45 megabytes per second or even more when, uh, when you are using the cards. Because in this way, you will be able to preview the picture much faster. But also, when you remove the card from the camera and you put it into your computer, it will copy the photos very fast. So you don't have to wait 10, 20, 40 minutes for, uh, for your photos. So I'm telling you just how you can save some time, because I know time is very expensive for everybody. OK, now, when I want to buy a new camera or a new lens, I'm always looking on this website called snapsort.com, because here I can compare two different kinds of cameras to see which one is better and why, which one gives me an ad advantage or not. So this usually helps me to take a better decision when I want to buy a camera. Now you know you need to have a camera that has a secondary screen on top. And also, there are two possibilities. You can have crop format sensor, which is DX, which is a smaller sensor, or full frame format sensor, which is a little bit bigger, which is exactly 35 millimeters, exactly like the old analog film. And I always recommend for dental photography, even if it's more expensive, to get a full frame camera because you will get the best possible results. Bigger sensor means capture more light. It means 
more light, it means better photography, because, you know, photography means painting with the light. So if we have bigger sensor, it's more expensive, of course, but you will have always professional quality. Uh, the X format is recommended when you do macro photography or extreme macro photography, when you want to shoot bugs, insects, then you can have amazing results with the X format. But we don't shoot that kind of details in, in intraorally, let's say. So the bodies that I recommend for minimum from here and up is to go for Nikon D7200 or 7100, which I don't know if you can find it anymore in the, in the stores, or if you want to, go, to do also great videos, but also good photos, I recommend you Canon ATD. So you have these two options. No matter if you like Canon or Nikon, you have two options. From here, you can go only up, not down below these specifications. And then I will tell you which lens I'm using. I told you I'm using only one lens for all my photos. It's Tokina, 100 millimeters. Yeah. I use this for cross polarization, for intraoral, for laboratory, for portraits, for close ups, you name it. I don't change my lens from the camera, never. And I told you one light source. I like to use usually studio lights for my photos, but when we don't have enough time and we have to make photo for every patient, I recommend you to have a setup like this. It is much, much faster to use because you have everything in one piece of equipment and then you have the flashes, you have the bracket arm, you have the controller and you are ready to shoot whenever you want. If you use studio lights, it's more complicated. You need a bigger room and so on. But for day by day work, I recommend you this kind of setup. No matter if it's R1, C1 from Nikon or Canon MT24AX with the wires for Canon. Good. What's next? These are the studio lights that I told you about that I'm using. Um, usually, the best possible result and the best daylight conditions you can reproduce with big studio lights. So that's why in my uh, training center we have uh, a special room designed only for photos and videos. Good. Edit protocol, it's almost nothing. Everything I do, I just import my pictures from the camera I drag and drop the picture directly into my Keynote on the MacBook because I'm using MacBook for all my photography. And here I increase the size of the picture, I rotate it, and that's all I'm doing for my pictures. If I want to have some extra sharpness, I'm using Aperture or Lightroom, nothing else. Here you can see, I use Keynote to arrange, resize, crop, add my logo because you should add your logo usually in the pictures. I have many pictures of mine that people remove my logo and put their names. It happens. And in Aperture, I just add a little bit of uh, color if it's necessary or sharpness. So for intraoral photography, if you want to do photos like this, I did this kind of photos with my studio lights. How? First of all, I need the big diffusion areas. That's why I use soft boxes and octo boxes. And you have to dry the gums. If you dry the gums, you will have a very nice texture like you see here. This is one crop photo. So I cut the original photo and then I cut this photo too and then I cut this photo too. So I think I have enough details only with a normal lens. I don't have to use macro rings, uh, inverted lenses or other kind of complicated procedures to get a super macro photo. You just have to crop the original photo and you can get enough details with only simple lens like Tokina. Here you have another example and another one, and another one. So this is not even the original photo. This is the cropped photo. And if you look, I cropped the cropped photo, and I get also this level of uh, sharpness. So just dry the gums before. These are the settings for intraoral photography. So you have F22, F29. You need a pair of uh, retractors, contrastors, more or less like this. So here you can see the original photo. I have cut my retractors and I'm using a black contrastor. And from this photo, I get this photo. And here, the lateral position. I use these special retractors. And from this photo, without using the mirror, I'm getting this photo here. So it is much less time consuming. I just take the camera, take these settings, I shoot, and that's it. 
you crop it in the keynote after that. We need internal photography to analyze the pink, to see different textures, and to learn from nature, to, to reproduce, even if it's direct restoration or indirect restorations. I'm not using too much uh, the ring flash. Usually, ring flash is recommended when you do surgeries, when you do a posterior area photography. But I like to use always twin flash. No matter with what kind of brand of the, the, the bracket, you can use many types of bracket. You, you know, the Sasha Hein has the, um, a new bracket. Then it's Osturk has another bracket. Then it has the Scorpion from Italy, this Molaris from my brand. So there are so many. I don't like to use for anterior area the ring flash because I will have a huge reflections in the anterior uh, vestibular area. That's why I use twin flash so I can have small reflections only on the sides and I can study the internal structure of the tooth. I can see the uh, halo effect, I can see the translucency, transparency, mamelons, and everything I want to see in the anterior area. If you want to have zero reflections on the surface, I'm recommending to use the polarized filter because it comes on a DSLR and you will be able to have professional photos like this. This is just an example from a young patient from Portugal. So you can see the halo effect and the mamelons and all the details inside. OK, for white balance, I remember I uh, said that we need to use the white balance on flash. And I'm using this shade guide. It's made by Arnold Drachenberg, a good friend of mine. He's uh, producing this handmade in Germany. And it gives me the possibility to have the gray card to have the gums and to have the four colors that are closest match to my patient. So I don't have to take four, four photos with each color separately and to struggle myself. I just hold this with two fingers. I take my camera and I make the photo. It's so, so easy to use. And also, if you need gray cards, instead of this, you can use also the eLab protocol from Sasha Hein, another also good friend of mine. Good. Color photography, so we need a set of two photos. The polarized one, if we, do, we are doing single crowns, or another normal photo taken with camera. Good. And here you can see, uh, with high contrast and low brightness from here, we can choose the chroma, where we have to add more dentin, more deep dentin, let's say. And here we can see different tones of gray. We can see the value from the color. So basically, if we have these two photos, we have also these two, because we duplicate this photo in Keynote and we get this photo and this photo by doing just this in the settings, high contrast, low brightness, or taking saturation down to zero. Perspective and symmetry is very important because usually the dentist go near the chair, patient is here, and you do the photo from here. So that's a not a correct position. Usually I ask my patient to get up, to stay on the feet, and then I do the photo from the same level with the same eye level with the patient. Not, from, not from, from up, because the crown will look longer. Not from down, because the crown will look shorter. So you have to have the same level. Or not from right and not from left, because one crown will be wider or one crown will be a narrow, more narrow. But if you go on top of the patient, you can have symmetry. These are good friends of mine from Spain, this uh, Federico and uh, Borja Diaz. So this is another way to do dental photography, but I think it's more dangerous. So for intraoral protocol, I'm usually, sorry, I'm usually having this set of photos. Usually I ask this for my dentist. And for me, it's enough as a technician to have an idea about what's going on there. And then we have some occlusal examples that I use today with the mirrors. So we shot this photo today with uh, mirrors. And this is the level of detail that we get if we crop even more the photo. So you can go to extreme details. Here is another example I took today in the morning on our booth. And we used mirrors here to have palatal. And this is after we crop the photo again. So we have extreme, extreme details. And lingual also, the same way, using mirrors. And usually, I like to use this kind of mirrors. Occlusal, I have usually two sizes, one and three. And I have also this for uh, palatal and lingual. So basically, these three kind of shapes are helping me to get the photos I want if I want to go even in the posterior area. You don't need, if you are using this tool, you don't need hot water no air spray, no liquid soap, nothing, because the mirror will not get foggy. You have this instrument that will blow always hot air on the surface, and your, uh, your mirror will be always perfectly sharp. 
Okay, so this will save a lot of time for you, and also it has LED light. So probably when you are doing intraoral photo, you know, in the mouth of the patient is dark, and your camera will not be able to focus because it's very bad light. So then these two LED will help you focus. Yeah, these are the angles when you do the, with the mirror. So it has to be 45 degrees, and camera has to be parallel with the smile line. And this is the equipment I recommend from Jacobi because they give me everything I need. I have the tool to hold the mirrors. I have the mirrors, which are very high quality. And then I have also the retractors inside. So you don't need anything else but this. OK, this is how it looks like a complete kit. And it has this photo mirror demister. And it's really a good tool for, for what we use. Yeah? Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, have a nice day. Thank you.